Welcome back. If you saw part one, that was the air conditioning parts and assemblies I used to install in 08492 for a concourse correct system. I've already done a bunch of the work and I wanted to now go through the installation process, review some of the difficulties, the tips and tricks it takes to install the air conditioning in a Ferrari Dino 246. The Dino air conditioning system has four hoses and four component systems at the conjunction of each of the hoses. Up front will be the condenser, and that is held to the car with four six millimeter cap bolts, as well as one six millimeter cap bolt for the clamp on the, yeah, the pipes coming out. In order to access all this area, you've got to remove the front hood, including the stay. Here, because if you leave the stay, the radiator actually will not have enough space to do that. So the first thing, remove the stay, the six millimeter screw, and be careful. That is a very rare step down screw, and you want to keep that for originality. Leave this attached to the hood, and then unscrew each of the three nuts there. Now, the way I do this myself to remove the hood, very delicately. You can see I've layered all these microfiber towels here, and when you pull the uh, nuts off the end, you raise it and leave these pivoted, leave the, leave the edge pivoted. And then finally, when all six bolts that hold the hood on are removed, you take it and put it someplace on. safe in your home. So the first component we're replacing in the uh, air conditioning system is the condenser up front and the two hoses which connect it. You'll look at the system here and see it's an extremely tight position. You can see it's also a great time to Clean the radiator, take that to your radiator shop and have that rotted and clean, as well as replacing the radiator fans like I've done here. As you see, any problem in the future is going to require, require uh, cracking like several systems to get to it. And right now you've got cooling and electrical systems that are going to be affected by the air conditioning. So I've redone those. Everything is fresh and new. Brand new fans. Cleaned out radiator. And now we mounted new air conditioning condenser. So bottom line, this is an area that's really tight to get to. And I know you've heard that before. And it affects multiple systems. Therefore, do as much work as you can in it, as much work as you can afford. Every Dino seems to install differently. I have 05702 behind me. And the only way I could install the radiator and the condenser was as one package together. I thought I was clever and ahead of the game, so when I came to 08492, I tried and I tried and I tried, and what happened? I struck the evaporator on the fans in front, on the radiator fan blades in front, and had to pull another one out of my stock to get a perfect one up front. So I learned a lesson that you really can't make any generalizations about how to install it. You've got to try. There is a crossbar in these USA cars as well as the radiator has a, a hard pipe coming out the bottom driver's side which causes interference and you've got to push the whole thing forward to enable to make it fit. So in this car 08492 I had to install the radiator first, angle it in such a way with the passenger side uh, raised up just a little, and then I would slip the condenser in the front and mount it. It was really a bit of a puzzle. There's a $500 loss right there in a condenser that got struck when I installed it. Make sure you trial fit everything and put a sheet of cardboard, thick cardboard, in front of the condenser when you go to install it. Also make sure that if you use tape on the bottom, you can reach that tape and remove it. I found that to be very difficult. The condenser was the most difficult part for me to install of the four component systems in the group for a Ferrari 246 AC system. Coming out of that are two hoses, an inlet on the top and an outlet on the bottom. Per Concor rules, rubber parts are considered consumable and replaceable with the current model and in this case, you can see I have the old one right there. I have quite a great similarity between the outlet hose to the dryer. 
and the the new hose in. But the top hose should really be a braided hose about a size bigger than this one with the hex fitting and gold cad. Whereas I am using what is currently available with the barrier hose. And if this is not allowed per concourse rules, then my claim it's concourse correct is in is this wrong. is the most visible hose pair of the whole system. And if that top hose has to be braided, then my claim this is concourse correct may be wrong. Up front is a factory hole near the battery cover there that allows us to view the dryer and its optical port on the top. That sight glass is, is, is located for a viewing so that you can tell if there are any bubbles going through the system. The condenser will provide a liquid to the dryer so any bubbles would indicate either a leak in the system or possibly a low fill in the system. And it's a diagnostic. Now a Concord judge could ask you to move to remove the spare tire so that he could actually look down and see and that's what he would view a proper sight glass on top of the dryer concourse correct this is easily viewable let's go down and look at that a little bit better remove the wheel inner wheel well and the ventilation ducting to reveal a space for the hose from the compressor to lay into as it comes across here, I lay it and hold it firm with zip ties and then twist it to make it through the complex curves, as well as also the curves going back into the tunnel. So the hose coming from the compressor to the condenser is over 12 feet long, and the tip there is when you need to make a turn that has an angle to it, add a twist to that. Now the hose coming off of the condenser is the smallest in the system. So here we have three, three of the four hoses of the whole system right here. And it's stuck behind the bar and mixed in with my battery cutoff switch. But here is the dryer. Let's see, can we get a shot up above? With the pressure switch. And I have wired the binary pressure switch in series here. I've also have a diagram from the chassis abstract on the powertrain for this too. This had both a high and low pressure switch. I have tapped into the high pressure. The low pressure will have to be jumpered so these are continuous. The air, the dryer as well as the red topped pressure port right here. Here's an access for diagnostic on the pressure. See if your condenser's clogged up. And oh, there's a good shot. And that is the dryer system. There is the clamp which secures the condenser to its mount. Just a six, six millimeter cap bolt. There's the access to the high pressure port, high pressure connections, and the binary switch. The hose fittings need to be torqued to specific values to make them correct and proper seals in the HNBR system. We're using number six hoses for our liquid down from the compressor to the condenser and the torque value we'll be using will be 13 foot pounds. On number eight, carrying the compressed froth from the compressor to the condenser will torque to 18 pounds on the number eight hose. Number 10 hose coming from the evaporator back to the compressor we're gonna hit it up at 22 pounds on the high side. Now I do lubricate the O-rings quite heavily with oil. People put light, I put more of a heavy, and I wipe it around all surfaces, both sides, inside and out, and leave a little bit just in the channel so it can move around. Now our service valves also, will be torquing those to 28 foot-pounds when we get to the compressor right now. We need to jumper the, now that we have installed the dryer and the number six hose connecting the condenser to the dryer as well as the pressure group, we need to finish wiring the pressure group. We've connected the by switch to our old high pressure switches. But if we look on our wiring chart, the electricity first comes to the low pressure switch and then the high pressure switch. So this is never gonna get here until it's shunted. Now the low pressure switch 
as we can see from the old group here, we had a capillary tube off, whereas the high pressure just had two contacts that we could connect directly to. This capillary tube is a low pressure system that goes to a switch box. Let's see if I can get those yellow and black. There we go. And the yellow and black wires are the wires we need to shunt. I've created a shunt, so let's get that in there. Tube is a low pressure system that goes to a switch box. Let's see if I can get those yellow and black. There we go. The rest of the capillary is there that in there and I do not want to remove that device even though it's inactive because there are rivets on the underside of the spare tire carrier that would show. I have disconnected the low pressure switch device with the two electrical contacts, pulled it out and cleaned up the contacts with Worth OL. They looked a little bit gunky so cleaned them up and then connected my blue jumper wire to them. So we preserved the wiring in the system. So the low pressure switch has been completely shunted. I got that shunt in blue there and, tight. and all strapped together and tidy up at the pressure section. So that's completed. We've got our hose from the condenser to the dryer. And now we need to fabricate probably the most particular hose of the group the dryer to the evaporator. It has to cross over the axle, the axle, and, and instead of the old 90 degree fittings, we now have modern 45 degree fittings, which were not available then. So we can optimize the flow in this very important region. Remember anything from the condenser to the evaporator is very, is, has the highest density and the most propensity to slow the flow. So when you have a connection on the old pipe that's a right angle, that's coming from your hardware department like this section, you cause massive eddies and backflows. We don't have that anymore. We have smooth 45 degree angle flows in and out, and this is just gonna facilitate the uh, refrigerant moving around the, citizen, the system in the most critical area. We're ready to go and start moving onto our third hose, the hose from the dryer to the evaporator. That's also something that we have to get to is the evaporator. The air conditioning hose going over the steering rack is the most critical one for angle and distance. So I find that in order to size it, I have to have the new evaporator installed. And to remove the old evaporator, you have to remove your batch board and then remove the fan here. And when I looked at this, this is a ventilation fan for the driver's side down there. This so has an 80 millimeter output connecting with a 100 millimeter hose. And furthermore, when you take it apart, and actually disassemble it, you find out it's rusted, it didn't fit, they had to put an extension tab, it wasn't the right one. And <laughs> instead of normally removing three six millimeter screws that would remove both the fan and the evaporator, they had it massively riveted in and we've now got a situation on our hands. So here's the correct housing and a 100 millimeter hose from 05702 behind me you can tell because the red overspray but it fits into the evaporators access hole with three six millimeter cap bolts securing into the top of the evaporators access hole so it seals all in as one unit across the cabin and provides venting. Now, there's no way this could do it with an 80 millimeter, and we can see they've just split the 100 millimeter hose in there and done it. I am now at a crossroads. So here's the problem. I could replace this. Uh, I have one that's bro that is that needs repairing. I have a fan that needs repairing, and then I would have the stock old system. I could fashion a new housing for the evaporator and fan and also uh, solve a second problem. Besides the ventilation flow, I would have ventilation distribution. What I can do is make a plenum 
that goes to all five cabin vents. Right now the air conditioning, as you can see, only goes to one vent and that's the center one on the dash. So the two people in the car have to fight over who gets air conditioning. Rotate it here, no this way, that way, no. <laughs> so stage one improvements of the system was gonna be a higher flow ventilation fan. Stage two improvements were gonna be full distribution to five outlets in the cabin instead of one. So I have a decision to make since I have really been thrown a curve. So much this car has been so original and now to find that an incorrect ventilation fan isn't really working in the system well. So once yeah. the evaporator ventilation fan in the forward compartment is removed, you'll need to remove the carpets out here and then a cabin cover that is secured with three of these five millimeter mushroom heads onto standards in there and pull this access cover back to reveal the evaporator. Before removing the evaporator, be sure and take care with the capillary tube to sense the freezing up of the evaporator core. Gently remove it and push it off to the side. Even though it looks like a solid wire, it's not. It's actually a capillary system with something exotic like Americanium in it, and it actually controls a substance that expands and then hits the pressure switch. switch. So yes, this is part of your console thermal switch and is the action part of it. So make sure you take care, do not destroy that. If you do, they are easily available well under a hundred bucks. Operator. From here, I've loosened it, but somebody had really conned it down with rivets and insulation tape on there too. So this is now out and we can look at the space I have available. Again, this was the unplanned part. I have to make some decisions. You've heard my priorities. And now we kind of have to see what we have. So we've got the condenser installed, our dryer and pressure group is saw installed, and the host of the evaporator as well as the evaporator is not installed yet and I have to make decisions. Let's move to the compressor now. This, the, uh, as we saw when we were inside, that bagged and covered hose end was the largest hose in the system going from the evaporator to the compressor. All right, welcome to the passenger side rear wheel well. We've removed that wheel, the inner fender and everything to get to the section of the air conditioning, which has the compressor and the two largest lines. Not only the largest diameter, but they're the longest too. Uh, it's over 12 feet going up to the condenser and that's a number eight sized hose and a number 10 returning from the evaporator and that is a over nine foot hose. So we've made it, laid our new hoses and be sure to make them spiral around. And make, make a nice smooth curve. You don't want kinks. There we are, there's a little bit. Through and pass it through the tunnel. In order to get to this point, we've had to crack and remove the cooling system, fuel system, ventilation system, ignition system, and all the belts and drives for it too, as well as loosen the alternator. So it's quite involved. You, you wanna make sure you seal this once and seal it right. So we'll be using a torque wrench for all of our fittings. The Ferrari Dino air conditioning system starts with a modification to the engine with a mounting plate right here. From that, the three studs will hold onto our mount for the bracket, and the bracket will be attached to our compressor. And from there, we'll be able to install the belts on. So it's a three-stage process. If you've ever wondered what the difference between a standard non-AC Dino is and a, and a Dino with AC, it's that mounting plate, the subsequent bracket, which will fit onto it, and then the holes on the back of the compressor. Let's get it mounted up. Lift the compressor into the place, but make sure you have the bracket in the back first. Bring the back bracket around. Since we're going to have to mount the hoses, we're gonna need a little bit extra flexibility. 
So bring the mat, bring the bracket around on the horizontal and make sure these caps are tight and turn the compressor sideways and fit the bracket onto the top. And then we'll rotate it sideways up. Let me get the other right. right. We're sliding the bracket into place on its side as we rotate. See, there's both of our valves. As we rotate this up, we will then be able to fit the valves onto there. And then we will attach the bracket to the mounting plate. The correct fasteners for both the compressor and the bracket to the mounting plate will be three square edged yellow ringed nylocks with associated washers. Three for the bracket and three for the mounting plate. Let's get it installed. Tighten down all three mounting bolts to the bracket, the studs and the 17 millimeter wrench that you'll need to tighten them. Okay, they're secure. I tightened them down pretty All right, we'll check for tightness on these three nuts onto the studs, and the bracket is securely mounted to our compressor. Now we have our sealing caps here to prevent the oil from leaking out, and I want to tell you, because when I removed the old one, it did leak out, and I had to have a, a catch pan. So be ready for that if you don't have the caps on. The new lines are ready to go. We're now going to tilt this back up, pull the caps, remove the caps, unscrew them, and screw on the new nine, nine. Uh, the new roto lock valves onto the compressor. So we'll rotate it up, slip it onto the studs. Where are those guys? Back there. And attach the fittings. There we go. All right, I have the bouncy tripod out because I'm going to have to use both hands to torque, and I do want to demonstrate this. The AC fitting torquing guide is right here, and you can see our largest hose is a return to the suction from the evaporator. That's a number 10, and we want to torque that from 8 to 22 foot-pounds. And our second one that runs that over 12 feet up to the condenser is a size number 8, and its torque value is 15 to 18 foot-pounds. Then when we get the Roto-Lock compressors on, we want to go 20 to 40. I've selected 28 foot-pounds, and those will be the horizontal ones. So you can see we have some real space concerns to get it. Here's my torque wrench. And I normally would put the valves on the compressor. I would prefer to put the valves on the compressor and then the hoses onto the valves. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to torque these because of the space concerns in here. I'm not going to be able to do that. To 22, which I have already. That's it. All right, that's 22 foot pounds. That's Got these in memory, isn't that handy dandy? There, 18 foot pounds, right, handy dandy one. yellow jacket, torque wrench. That's it. Now we're ready to pull the caps, mount the valves on them, and torque them to 28 foot pounds. I've removed the caps from both of the rotor lock fittings. As you can see, these are brand new white. When I attach the valves and torque them, it will actually crush. The Teflon seal, the white seal you can see there. So should I not be happy with this in some way, the seal was a one-shot use and I'll have to replace it. Now I have a whole bag of these in my AC kit, so it's no big with me. But if you're using this and it comes like this, you will have only one pair from the manufacturer. So let's mount these up and gently fit them on. All right, both the fittings and the lines are connected, so let's let's attach it to the car. All right, the compressor had to lay to down get the valves in then up, upright up. and then attached to the bracket and then the mounting plate. I've now inserted two of the proper belts. They're Continental AV 10 millimeter by 900 millimeter, and I've lined up the belts correctly, tightened them correctly, and installed the three nylocks. You can see there's one that's right there and another one right down there. 
not an easy task on that bottom one. You had to use both hands. And then ratchet wrenches are very helpful. Uh -huh. Oh yes, one important wire is the clutch wire. It's a serial connection wire of all the devices that ends up here at the electromagnetic clutch. This will also be our test position if we have any issues because this will be the final point that electricity passes through a serial daisy chain to get here. And this will tell us if everything upstream is working electrically. So that's your pickoff point, your clutch connection to there. Compressors tighten, new hoses are in, new valves are in. You'll notice these do not I have some backseat valves, which will fit right over those after we fill it. I'm going to add that in the future too to make it look original OEM. But we are ready to go in the back of the engine compartment with new hoses, new compressor. So let's button things up, tighten the fuel system back in, install the cooling system, the oil delivery. The vintage compressor caps for the access fill ports is, are now installed on, making the compressor look completely original. So everything's installed except the fourth component, the evaporator, and the fourth hose that goes to the evaporator. So I'm starting to do some research into it. If you have the chassis abstract service manual for the 246 GT in 1973 or later, this will have the wiring diagram for the air that includes the air conditioning. You'll actually see on the sheet that they had a physical See right here, this section has been added for the air conditioning. Someone's just typed it out and glued it on, as well as they've made an addition to this. Unfortunately, as you can see, the, the numbers are backwards. They've actually flipped them in some way. So I have scanned it and flipped it so that I could actually read the numbers. And I've traced down the power system for the air conditioning system if you are looking for the electricals on the on the air conditioning system i have created a synopsis of this on the powertrain diagram if you believe the factory documents uh, that are correct and sometimes that's not a solid premise but if this wiring diagram is correct i've created a block diagram of what the power, how the power flows through the system. The powertrain for the Dino 246 GTS air conditioning system is a serial chain ending at the 12 volts being applied to the clutch if all of the switches and selections upstream of it are passed on. The first is the fuses. The power comes from the battery to the fuses and that will be the rear fuse block and the diagram shows it is the last fuse, the aftmost fuse in the aftmost fuse block. That's a 25 amp fuse. The first place the power starts as the battery goes through that fuse blocks and then hits the fan switch. In which then it goes through the thermal control. Both of the fan switch and the thermal control are in the console. If the thermal control activates, uh, then power is shunted to the right radiator fan, turning it on. It also has a second output to test to the minimum pressure, then the maximum pressure, and then the clutch. Now I'm replacing that with a binary, and I've shunted the minimum pressure, as kind of shown in that diagram. So that's the powertrain in a Dino 246 GTS. We're gonna start applying this as we look for solving our evaporator solution. Thanks for coming along on the air conditioning restoration and installation today. As we saw, I have three of the four component groups in and three of the four hoses in. The final being the hose from the dryer to the evaporator as well as the evaporator group. Now that's ballooned out if you <laughs> have, have as, most, as typical of most Dino projects. And in order to get to the evaporator, I had to remove the carpets. The carpets were not original to the car, and in checking with Matthias Bartz, I have the original color scheme. In fact, I can see from remnants around the evaporator that the original carpet was red. Get some more light on it. It's a brilliant red, maroonish almost. Very nice, and of course, we've attained the same correct carpets from World Upholstery. So those will also go in. And the original seats you can see have 
the original red inner piping as well as black outer. I have outer. removed the passenger side seat and I've started to apply a leather reek leather restoration. But you can see here on the driver's side bolster, there's black under here. Right. This is the original leather. So I have the original leather and I can see hints of the red interior here and the black outer on the piping under a real bright light. So Matthias Bartz has uh, sent me the spec and this car is going to be returned to spec. Black on the bolster shows the original colors coming through. The red highlights on the Daytona puffiness. The black on the high bolster wear area of the driver's seat is showing through confirming that this tan was a dye. And let's also take the project on of returning this back to its original configuration. I have the original leather here. Let's get the colors back to original. Stay tuned for a future task coming up on the Club Dino Gem.